to visual effects and i request uh, all of you uh, if you have any questions or comments please put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself after the talk and speak uh, on to the microphone with this uh, uh, housekeeping points i request uh, dr sriman narayana and dr mahala to take over please keep all the mics muted mics must be kept muted except in for, for that of the speaker and the moderator and dr sriman narayana is a senior consultant cardiac anesthesiologist working in narayana dialya with me and dr mahala is uh, one of the leading cardiac uh, cardiologists with uh, equal competence with echocardiography as well as interventional cardiology and uh, he uh, he is an expert in echocardiography and with these words i request dr sriman narayan to start the session yeah good morning good morning everybody on this sunday morning breakfast echocardiography classes will start now uh, our uh, eminent speaker uh, dr mala who is a intervention cardiologist and echocardiographer uh, i ask him to take over and start the class thank you sir dr mala uh, thank you very much dr sima yes, morning sir Uh, i think my screen is visible to you all yes yeah yes uh, yes good, mo <laughs> good morning to everybody uh, today what uh, dr murlidhar said a breakfast session and it is a very interesting breakfast it is going to be so i'm going to talk on stemi and echocardiography this is a really very interesting area what is the role of echocardiography in stemi what is stemi st elevation myocardial infarction so do i need an echo before i start the topic i'll ask this question to me do i need an echo to do a stemi intervention the answer may be no so stemi diagnosis is best on the ecg and the biomarkers and in the ecg so the st elevation and with the biomarkers positive along with the ischemic symptoms i will proceed for a primary intervention or primary pci but what is the role of echo then is the echo going to give me the diagnosis of the stemi which way it is going to help me let us see during the course of the talk so this echo is based on what echo is based on the visual assessment of the wall thickening and the motion abnormalities what we find so majority of the patients with acute mi will have wall motion abnormalities mind it is it is not sine qua non the role of strain imaging and the most important is the complications so if we go back to the guidelines of the societies and uh, find out see if in 2013 the accha said the stemi you do assess the left ventricular ejection fraction should be assessed in all patients with mi this is class 1 with the level of evidence c so only the ejection fraction and if you look at the same stemi 38 they put a class 2b indication for the ischemia or the viability evaluation pre discharge if you look at the 2012 esc guideline it is says in acute phase when the diagnosis is uncertain emergency echo is to be done basically in triage when you are the diagnosis is not sure about the mi or the stemi if inconclusive in the echo or unavailable so echo can be inconclusive as well so emergency angiography should be considered that's a class 1 and all patients should have an echocardiography for assessment of infarct size and the resting lv function mind it the acc said left ventricular ejection fraction only but the esc said infarct size and resting lv function so do we need an echo to assess the infarct size or the ecg is enough i'll be coming to this and for the ischemia or the viability evaluation by doing an echo and they have put it as a number 3 as a class 1 evidence a uh, class 1 uh, to level of evidence a so in com contrast to the ecch so there is discordant between the societies what is the role of echo during stemi now let us come to the universal definition of mi 
So the universal definition which was presented in 2018 said, it is not the, this criteria is very important. You have to check the biomarker first. Rise and or fall of troponin along with one of the criteria. So what are the criteria? Symptoms of ischemia, ECG changes like STT, new bundle branch block or Q wave. Then if you look at the fourth point, imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium or new regional wall motion abnormalities. Underline this line. What does it mean? We should have an echo preceded by a definite biomarker, which is troponin positive. But if the echo should show new loss of viable myocardium. So what do you mean by new? That means we should have an old echo report to compare. So if we do not have a old echo report, it has less value. And if we do not have a troponin, which is positive or rising or falling, this echo has no value. Mind it come down. So there is a prior myocardial infarction. The patient might have an infarction before. So in that situation, imaging evidence of a region of loss of viable myocardium that is thinned, scarred, or aneurysms. So if you have a thinned and scar, which we see every day in the ischemic heart disease patients, is definitely is chronic ischemic heart disease, not ST elevation MR. So now let us go to the ischemic cascade. When we get the changes of the STEMI changes in the echo, first to the normal, then once the patient has decreased blood supply, there will be a perfusion abnormalities. We need a contrast echo myocardial perfusion study. Then the diastolic function abnormalities. Next, but there are many causes of diastolic function abnormalities. Then comes strain. Strain can be altered, but strain is not going to give a diagnosis of STEMI. It will say wall motion abnormality. Then comes regional wall motion abnormality, which we score. That is next. Then ECG changes. And then angina, finally that leads to infarction and the scarring. If you look at this, before the clinical presentation of angina, and there are many changes happening, including perfusion, diastolic abnormalities, strain changes, and RWMA. So if you look at all other echoes, it has some variability, except coming to RWMA. So RWMA will not tell me it's STEMI. It will say there is impaired contraction. Now let's look at the ECG. In the first panel on the top, you have a ST elevation MI. So can I predict what is this MI, big or small, more leads involved, it is a larger MI. So like say one AVL, V1 to V6, lot of ST, magnitude of the ST elevation, number of leads involved, indicate large MI. I don't need an echo to quantify the extent of MI, which was said in the ESC. If we come to this second ESC down, inferior ST elevation, two, three AVF. So we think this is a small MI, small area of the LV is involved. But if you look at this lateral wall, V4, V5, V6, including ST depression, so it becomes inferior posterior lateral MI. So this is a large MI, should not be ignored. And these kind of patients can have mechanical complications. I'll come later what this patient had. If you look at the right panel on the top, there is a MI with less ST elevation, but there is a right bundle branch block. It indicates anterior wall MI, with a proximal LED lesion. This patient can have worst outcomes in comparison to the other issues. So if you look at the down picture, if you get a myocardial infarction, what are the changes happening? Is everything infected? If you look at this area, what is called ischemic numbra, you find zone of ischemia, zone of injury, and zone of necrosis. So it is a numbra which is we are seeing. This numbra, how does it affect the echo? that we are going to see. If the patient has ischemia, the chances of recovery with revascularize is very much, it may be near to 100%. Injury may be 50%. Infarction, which is a real necrosis, is not going to recover. If you look at the perfusion, after we do perfusion in a STEMI patient, whether it's a spontaneous recanalization by giving thrombolytic therapy or doing a primary angioplasty, is that everything is giving a correct or major or improving the myocardium instantaneously? No, there can be damage because of the reperfusion. So let us see this. Reperfusion has two compartments. One is the vascular compartment. One is the cardiomyocyte compartment. After the occlusion of the artery, there can be microembolization. There can be impaired vasomotion. We call it intense adrenergic activity. So vessels will look very small, spasm, when you do the primary angioplasty. There can be edema, perivascular edema, capillary obstruction, 
and uh, inflammatory cells can be adhered there and there will be stasis and there can be a capillary rupture and hemorrhage these changes simultaneously also happening based on the time from the occlusion if you go to this side left side of the panel you see irreversible injury starts apoptosis and, and uh, this is proteolysis mitochondrial collapse calcium overload causing stiffening of the muscle and adjacent zone zone hypercontractility rupture of the sarcolemma so these things leads to irreversible damage so next comes the localization of the stemi so do i need an echo to localize or the ecg is enough echo is also a surrogate for localization you have leptman to lad lcx and rca this is the basic thing is this artery supply to a definite territory or there are watershed areas there are definite watershed areas like see this side lateral wall has a watershed between lad and lcx this side has a watershed between lad and rca and the posteriorly there is a watershed between lcx and rca so one particular artery does not supply a definite territory there are watershed areas in between so it gives a confusion which territory is involved now comes the complication and echo plays a very very essential role to pick up these complications whatever the varieties you get impaired contractility tissue necrosis electrical instability or pericardial inflammation everywhere it can have a complications in stemi let us look at the contraction impaired it can have a thrombus formation in stroke the patient may present with a stroke hypotension and if this hypotension not corrected this will propagate the ischemia it will cause infarct extension and cardiogenic shock so hypotension need to be corrected tissue necrosis papillary muscle dysfunction parsevalent muscle rupture mitral regurgitation heart failure or even sudden cardiac arrest ventricular rupture ventricular uh, intramedullary septal rupture can lead to tamponent or bsr electrical instability arrhythmias pericardial inflammation pericarditis of course electrical instability you can pick up in the ecg pericardial inflammation effusion tamponade we have to pick up an echo so echo stands or plays a very very essential role in stemi patients to pick up the complication like say example i have given the ecg in the down in for posterolateral mi this patient was planned for primary pci of expected circumflex territory and somebody pulls in echo machine finds in papillary muscle rupture so here it is not the tries to the cath lab balloon time it should be a tries to the or time because quickly doing an angio sending the patient for surgery saves a life now look at this autopsy or the histopathological study what do we see in the infarction stemi we see like this the black spot one to two days of mi we get a hemorrhage and the development of the contraction bands and 3 to 7 days you look at the papillary muscle here papillary muscle here this papillary muscle is healthy this papillary muscle is pale your central areas or peripheral areas of hemorrhage in the periphery and the papillary muscle and the pale centers so pale centers with the hemorrhage in the periphery 3 to 7 days and even 1 to 2 days you get this hemorrhages and contraction bands and if you go for longer duration you find aneurysms scarring and the whitening of the myocardium areas if the patient has a sudden cardiac arrest and we don't have the history clinical findings or ecg or the timing of uh, anything happened to the patient even in a histopathology or the autopsy you can pick up the hemorrhage and the rupture or the or the vsr or cardiorexesis or the contraction bands which looks red in color surrounding hemorrhage even in post mortem a patient who had a sudden cardiac arrest and died even you can pick it up if this changes in the histopathology so now with a word of caution after saying so what is the role of echo in stemi and is it sine qua non or is very good modality it has to remember that regional wall motion abnormality at rest no only be seen when the diameter stenosis is more than 85% we take angiographically any other vessel other than left main more than 70% so if it is 70 to say 85% i am doing an arresting echo i'll not be able to pick up rwm many times a patient complain oh echo is normal you say there is a block 70% so a resting echo will be absolutely normal unless there is an infarction or ischemia demonstration but however a exercise echo can pick up a lesion up to be uh, uh, around 50% and above in comparison to a resting echo which is requires 85% in one of the study second point 
Echocardiography can overestimate the amount of myocardium. Let's example, we do the echo. We found out, oh, this LV is gone. It's hardly 20%, but it's hardly say, two hours of post-MI. We can take for angioplasty after two days, LV is recovered. So what does it mean? So because echo overestimates the amount of infected myocardium because of these regions, tethering, disturbances in the loading condition, and stunning. Most important is the stunning. Adjacent areas will be having RWM also in the next slide. And wall thickening and motion should be considered because we don't see thinning or scarring or big aneurysms other than the apex in STEMI. Residual wall motion abnormalities can occur without coronary artery disease, which I'll be showing some slides. So it is not a sign to announce that you get RWM, it is CAD and STEMI. So now let us see about the wall motion abnormalities, water shed area. Normally we do the echo in four chamber, two chamber or three chamber and a short axis view at the basal, median, apical level. I will show you the four chamber commonly we see. If you look at the four chamber of the LV, the LED too? area is on the top and this water shed area and the septum in the middle between LED and RCA, the basal part is RCA. The lateral wall, the basal is LCX, middle part is water shed between LED and LCX, so LED is very small area. When we look in four chamber, oh, this is not contracting. So everything is gone. Similarly, in the short axis in the papillary muscle level, this is LAD. This is water shed between LAD and RCA. This is RCA. This is LCA. And this is water shed between LAD, uh, LAD and LCA. So we do not see a bigger area of the LAD in any of the views other than these two views. Come to this a two chamber view, large area of the LAD and RCA. In the three chamber view, large area of the LAD and LCX. And if you, the another short axis view, which is ignored, is the apical short axis view. If you look at these segments, six segments is the basal level, and six segments at the papillary muscle level, and four segments in the apical level. And the inferior part is RCA, which comes from the PD, which is either LCX dominant or RCA. Rest of the area is LED. So if you have a doubt in the short axis view in the papillary muscle, how bad is the LED MI? And you can do an apical short axis or a two chamber or a three chamber view, it will give you a better idea than a four chamber view. So now let us go to the direct model, the cartoon and the real world picture. So if you look at the short axis view on the papillary muscle level on the right side versus this cartoon, look at where is the location of the LED. LED is on the top and the circumflex is the anterolateral papillary muscle below that. And posteromedial papillary muscle, the RCA is diagonally opposite the papillary muscle. So when you look at this area, short axis of the LV, it's contracting well. That means this is the area LED, water set, RCA, LCX, water set, and LED. So this area is LED only. This is RCA, LCX, water set, water set. So now let me show one RW and the LED. So this LED has ischemia or infarction. What happens to this territory contraction? Look at this. Only the look visibility is inferior is contracting. We say, oh, it's a large MI damage LV dysfunction. But the watershed area between the LED and RCA or LED and LCX is not contracting possible that factors I have described, one of them is stunning. So now let's go to the another picture. So this is a four chamber view and ST elevation MI in the entry wall. If you look at this, LED is not contracting. The basal areas are hypercontracting. So if you look at an ejection fraction of the LV, which the guidelines say, either you underestimate or overestimate. Because underestimation is due to watershed areas, overestimation is due to the basal areas contracting very well. So another finding we find is the pseudo prolapse or the, or the AML prolapsing here causing mitral regurgitation, which will add to the problem. Actually, it's not a pseudo prolapse, it's the AML. It is the tethering to the cordy of the PML because of the ischemia or infarction. You can have additional, and the bottom picture here very clearly says, shows that the cordage to the PML is tethered and you can have mitral regurgitation. If the patient presents late, you will not be surprised to find thrombus in the LV. Now let us go for the next slides to see. This is the patient who had an LAT occlusion total and we opened. So angioplasty opened, the flow is nice. So it is the epicardial coronary artery flow which will not decide the RWMA recovering the patient. It is the myocardial flow, myocardial blast or a teeming count, counts which will decide the flow and the recovery of the ventricular function. 
many times we do the primary angioplasty artery is open the ventricle is not recovered well i'll be showing a picture of this let's see this patient so this patient had undergone an angioplasty of the led large led long lesion and had slow flow no reflow phenomena after giving lot of chemical agents like we do during angioplasty there was slight better flow and look at this lv lv was down with bigeminy or ectopics in the left panel you can appreciate ectopics and after angioplasty there is some improvement in the contraction ectopics has disappeared but it is not recovered as expected so it is the myocardial blus or the flow to the capillaries which will decide the recovery it may only take little time to recover so why so did the important role of echo here then comes to the right ventricular infarction why right ventricular to study separately it is associated with one third of the patients with infarmi proximal rc occlusion it can happen right ventricular when the lcx is very dominant a given pd or it can happen when the led is wrap around the led going around the apex supplying towards part of the rv or the septum so these things ecg we know certain criteria we use v3 or v4 r but let us see what happens if the right coronary artery is gone here before the this is called rv branch follow the rv gone along with the lv so inferior lmi the lv may be infarcted in a smaller area but rv is gone you have acute marginal branch it goes to the plv or pda so that goes to the lv this area supplies the rv beyond this you have a sinus node artery conus branch if before this rv branch the rv will get damaged let's see what happens you open you did an angioplasty or she opened let's look at the rv so you see the rv the rv may be dilated there may be tricuspid regurgitation there is aneurysm at the apex of the rv tapsy will be down so filling pressure should be high jbp may be raised so you can find in addition to lv you can find various pictures here and one should not underestimate it has implication in treatment when you have an rvmi in you can get a non hypertensive tr one of the patients with rvmi was desaturating with the inferior lmi so the the lungs were very clear so we were thinking why patient is desaturating probably there is some pathology in the lungs so we restricted the fluid which is given more fluid challenge rvmi found out there is a pfo which is something right to left so the rv pressure rf pressure goes up pfo is present near about 30% even at the age of 60 70 you can have a right to left shunt through the pfo in rvmi causing desaturation which will misread as the lungs pathology causing desaturation or lv failure so now is there any role of diastolic parameters in this study or uh, the stemi patient so we look at the systolic function as per the guideline we look at the complication which will be coming diastolic function also very important if you look at a stemi patient has gone to heart failure can be class 2 onwards and you find ask for an echo echo says ea 45% but patient is breathless is in heart failure how do i explain ea 45% what you call mild reduced ejection fraction the re- acute rise in the lvtp the pressure volume loop will shift upwards acute rise in lvtp will rise the la pressure and e by e prime that can lead into pulmonary edema like heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction or heart failure with mild reduced ejection fraction lv ejection fraction may not appear that low so this parameter should be also studied there is a paper e by e prime in relation to outcomes in st elevation myocardial infarction in april 2020 it says e by e prime is associated with poor outcome in hospital whereas lv ef is a stronger predictor for long term outcome so lv ef has less value acute in hospital rather other parameters like e by e prime may be helpful so then the strength what i have showed before this systolic this rwm is visible there will be a strain abnormality this is what a longitudinal strain looks normally and if you find an mi patient you do a strain study by a quick machine having the facility you will find the vessel area is contracting well apical area there is a huge gradient and not to forget normally there will be minimal gradient but if you get a bigger gradient definitely you can pick it up so what is the role of gls how does it going to add to the rwm so gls is manifested before rwm one second this is a very interesting study which pointed out the patients with clip class 1 not in heart failure with the stemi those who in heart failure you can predict if you do a gls it is significantly reduced this patient of clip class 1 may progress in front of you to heart failure to clip more classes bigger classes that can be picked up in 
and strain. So coming to the complications, not only as I have said, STEMI, echo, not much information, we'll get more information about complications. So thrombus, right ventricular infarction, mitral regurgitation, papillary muscle rupture, VSR, preval rupture. The important piece of information I want to give you here, neither primary angioplasty without LV angio, nor ECG will give you idea about thrombus. It is the echo. Two, right ventricular infarction, I said V3, V4, R, but it will not give you hemodynamic information unless you check the right ventricle, which I have already explained. Mitral regurgitation, papillary muscle rupture, the patient will deteriorate instantaneously with a sudden cardiac arrest. You have no ECG surrogators to pick up the mechanical complication like papillary muscle rupture. VSR, the rise in the pulmonary pressure, mild to moderate acutely, right at failure or biventricular failure will take time. You will have no surface indication other than an enteral MI. So pre-war rupture instantaneously will have tamponant and patient will be arrest. So there is no surface presentation either in the ECG or I'm doing in a primary angioplasty to pick up this complication. It is echo, echo, and echo. So let us see now. So this is the LV angio. I'm doing in a primary angioplasty. If an idea of this LV angio and in thrombus, I will be careful in terms of if I'm thrombolizing. So the the standard dictum is the LV thrombus occurs in the RWM area. If you look at this picture, RWM thrombus. And here is a small thrombus. And here if you look, this is contracting. So because of this contraction, better contraction, the thrombus is moved out. And it is trying to escape. So my point is that we can increase the flowing time also. Because patient is settled down the 16 hour position, vitals are okay, Hello. Is okay. So we can wait for the two or Hello, uh, please keep the mics off. Mics are off. Rajiv. This is how overlap. Yeah. So Rajiv, another last Rajiv, question. Please pass, switch off the mics of the participants. Yeah. So the echo last picture showing a thrombus patient had an RVMI before Rajiv. now developed LVMI. You have a thrombus which so looks are, less hyperechoic than the RV. You will not be surprised to see this complication. So now this picture, it will show you the ECG of that infrapostulatal MI. So there is a, a papillary muscle rupture on the right top panel. And there is MR. I will be showing one MR picture. And this is a BSR picture. And this is a infrapostulatal MI with pericardial effusion. So we underreport this pericardial effusion. Oh, maybe due to heart failure. There can be a pseudory aneurysm with a rupture with a content uh, pericardial effusion or a tamponant here. So one should be very, very careful reporting STEMI patients, RWMA and pericardial effusion. So now let us look at this echo. So there is something visible on the mitral leaflet and this patient acutely rupturing in our hospital, the uh, got up at around 12 to pass urine, suddenly become breathless and collapsed. So the echo showed some amount of MR. So this is what is the peculiarity of acute papillary muscle rupture MR. This MR is described something random or bigger. You will not be able to see it properly. You will not be quantify how severe, but moment you get a flail or the papillary muscle rupture, it has to be severe MR. So if you look at this MR, it looks a little bigger. There is no, if the color gain is 69, quite high, still it's not visible. Whereas subacute presentation of the papillary muscle on the right side, you can see the MR, you can quantify, you can see very well, whereas acutely in front of you, you will not be able to see it. This patient should be, OR should be activated just quick when angiogram, send the patient for surgery, it will be saved. So now another patient, ST elevation MI, goes for a primary angioplasty, routine echo done, routine echo surge, RWM in the LED territory, and you miss something. So because even a routine echo might not pick up a VSR, ventricular septal rupture because usually it happens in the apical areas and apical area is usually forced to attend all views. You need to have the modified view of the apex in the long axis or in a subcostal view propelling the apex. This last picture, I'm going to play this. So where you can see the VSR is missed. So the treatment will be different. And when you pick up a VSR and here the stethoscope plays a very, very important role. If somebody have put, just put a stethoscope, they'll never miss a VSR or a papillary muscle rupture because you'll get a new onset systolic mama. So the echo and the stethoscope plays much more important role here rather than ECG or primary angioplasty. 
So now papillary muscle rupture. Now this is very peculiar to cervix. So the people are the the anybody doing the echo will be thinking, oh, papillary muscle rupture must have been a very bad MI, multiple MI, recurrent MI like that. Usual stories like this. Usually 82% is the first event. The first time something somebody having MI will have papillary muscle rupture. And it will be a single vessel disease most of the time. Area of necrosis small, which I showed you the left panel papillary muscle rupture contraction looks good. Poor prognosis 90%. Everything is first time, but the mortality is 90%. So the mechanical complication like papillary muscle rupture should not be ignored. Thinking that is a first MI, small damage, and single vessel disease, nothing. It is going to have higher mortality. And another interesting information is we have two papillary muscles, anterolateral posterior medial. Luckily, the anterolateral papillary muscle has dual supply, whereas posterior medial has a single supply. The rupture or the damage or a papillary muscle dysfunction, ischemic damage in the heads of the papillary muscle will happen to the posterior medial because of the single supply. Then the aneurysms. Is the echo helpful? The mostly the aneurysms will indicate a chronic ischemic heart disease. However, apical aneurysms like in Takosuba or other ischemic heart disease, apical aneurysm, you can find during STEMI as well even if it's slightly late presentation. So the sensitivity of the echo 93 to 100%, you can pick up aneurysms in echo. And 85 to 90%, 95% involve the apex. So if you are a little careful of the theory part of it, you will be changing the apex to find out uh, because it requires a special views to find the apical aneurysms. Thrombus in one third of the patient, the aneurysms will find thrombus. Echo will pick up all this. And another interesting piece of information, if you find an aneurysm, which we find commonly true aneurysms, all the three layers, like the pericardium, myocardium, and endocardium, here the aneurysm in the echo will look very big. So we worry about this, oh, large, in fact, big aneurysm. Whereas if you come to the pseudo aneurysm, because it is a small rupture with the content hematoma around, pseudo means there is no wall, this is covered by the blood and the pericardium. So this will look very small. We underreport this energy. Oh, small energy, nothing to worry. But that is pseudo. I'll show you an NGO picture of this. This is the NGO. And echo shows bottom column, large postural energy. Here in the LV NGO shows postural large energy. We say very large energy. Whereas in the right panel, if you look at the LV NGO, looks nice. There is a small penetration of the dye here. And this area is total content hematoma. So this area, this energy is here. Uh, there is a pericardial effusion or a hematoma, and there is one rent here. And this is a dangerous aneurysm than this true aneurysm. So that has to be addressed immediately. So the, while doing the echo, if you find an aneurysm, be sure. If you do not, you are not very sure, you have other modalities to be added to this. So now another aneurysm here, I can show you this is a true aneurysm, but big one. So that is not a pseudo, so we can confirm with other modalities. You can have significant MR here because of the tethering and the aneurysm. CT, does it add? Yes. It can pick up the true aneurysm, pseudo aneurysm, surrounded hematoma. Yes, adds to this. Another is plain CT. Can CT pick up or do help us during STEMI? Yes. It is like same three chamber, four chamber, two chamber view. You can get RWMA, you can get a mechanical complication, but it's a time consuming. We will have less time. Earlier is the best for us. We proceed for intervention immediately without this, but one can study as a completion of the text. So this is about the CT. Now, one picture I'm going to show and ask, what is the diagnosis here? Is there any DD for STEMI echoes, differential diagnosis? So I'm showing you an image. One has to find out, is the hereditary infarct with aneurysm, hereditary ischemia or infarct, burling load due to valve disease? None of that. Let's see now. So this is the image play. So what we see, valves looking fine, is not completely opening. And there is a RWMA, in the LED territory. The vessel segment is contracting laterally. And the septal vessel segment is contracting, but lesser. And this is, I'll be diagnosing as RW and the LED territory, ischemic heart disease. So some LV dysfunction. And uh, next, see the short axis. So this is, again, LV dysfunction, the LED territory hype hypokinesia or echinacea, other territory contracting well. And so my diagnosis will be second, ischemic heart disease, LED territory ischemia or infarction without energy. Uh, let us go back to the question and again answer. So this is the question. So LED ischemia, infarct, now go back, go back to this. 
So this is sure shot ischemic heart disease, the first instance if I look at. But if we analyze this picture in detail, this LV looks coarsely trabeculated. It is not finely trabeculated like vessel part of the septum and the lateral wall. There are crypts and the recesses. You will not be surprised to see the thrombus. Let us look at the sodacity. The big, big crypts, recesses, you may find thrombus inside, LV dysfunction, you will have MR. This is not ischemic heart disease. This is LVNC, non-compaction of the LV. So you will be having a differential DD. Of course, we will be like to rule out the coronary artery disease here, but the LVNC can confuse with the ischemic heart disease. Now, next, any other issues which will have a DD? <clears throat> this is LVB, and this is a very, very task for us when the patient comes to the ST elevation in the anterior lids, LBBB, and we have certain criteria called Garbosa criteria to differentiate. It will be very, very difficult in the echo. There will be RWMA, septal jerk, dilator ventricle, and MR, and even regional wall motion abnormality is very well seen. But uh, the thing is, in the LBBB, in the criteria, what I have said in the beginning, new and set LBB or presumably new. If we do not have previous ECG, first time patient presenting with ischemic symptoms, troponin elevated, new onset LBB, we take his MI and we proceed for primary PCI or intervention. However, if we do a study, you can find a dyssynchrony between the lateral wall and the septal wall. So now, so the conclusion. So how the eco helps in STEMI patients? It is helping in the diagnosis, extent, no. It provides prognostic information. What I showed you, the complications and uh, what you are showing, seeing the extent of damage, then it can track recovery of function after intervention. I have shown you the image. After PCI, there is definite recovery. You can track it. And you see pre-discharge, even follow-up echoes can tell you what has happened to this. Identify virtually all mechanical components. This is the point to be underlined. In STEMI, if you're doing an echo, you can find out or pick up all mechanical complications virtually. Role of advanced imaging. There are studies, uh, there are things happening in the GLS areas, and it can be incorporated to pick up this, uh, I, this wall motion abnormalities before. Even you can predict which is going for LV dysfunction uh, or heart failure during the course of the hospital. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mala, for an elaborate study. Uh, I call on the audience for questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that was a lovely presentation, extremely well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very a much. lot of information given within uh, the time span. Uh, I just wanted to make one comment and one question. Yes, please. In the AHA ACL guidelines, so the algorithm. Yes. For uh, acute MI treatment, acute coronary syndrome, uh, there is no mention about echocardiography as a screening modality. Yes. Uh, the, the, they have emphasized the role of echocardiography as center of yes. diagnostic pathway. Yes. And they, if there is ST segment elevation, I might just take the patient to the cat lab. Yes. So what has happened is in a couple of cases, uh, we have seen a patient with acute uh, chest pain uh, was uh, had some ST abnormality was taken to the CAT lab, but the coronaries were normal and he had acute uh, uh, sorry uh, aortic stenosis. Yes. And in a, another case, uh, patient mm -hmm. actually had uh, aortic dissection and thrombolytic therapy was given, and then uh, echo was done and then it was found that the patient had acute uh, dissection. So based on these two cases, we have written to the AHTA that uh, you should include screening echo in the algorithm. And we presented this in the AHA meeting in 2020. Yes. This is a comment. And the question is, will it be possible to differentiate apical ballooning in top, uh, with patients with uh, top foot supermyopathy and mm -hmm. acute MI, can it be possible to say that uh, this is acute MI, not, not because of uh, uh, talk about support disease? Yeah, uh, I'm just coming to the first part. Uh, as you said, uh, this echo, 
Uh, that is what the interest part yes. of the talk what I presented. As per the guideline, there is no right. role of echo. But echo plays yes. certainly a role of uh, picking up complications. As you said, the patients of dissection can have a MI and dissection together. So right coronary artery getting dissected in a type A dissection. Mm -hmm. Right, the patient right. presents with infral MI chest pain, and you do an echo, you find a type of dissection along with infral MI. So, if you thrombolize mm -hmm. that patient, obviously you are inviting a trouble. So, the echo yes. definitely helps in ruling out problems rather than giving a diagnosis of stemming. That's one. Number right. two is about the Takosubo cardiomyopathy. Takosubo is a diagnosis, is a stress inducer called broken heart syndrome. So where yes. the diagnosis is based on you developed an ECG of MI, you will find an apical ballooning in the echo or in angio. But if you do the coronary, you will find no coronary arteries. So yes. you re require an angiogram to define somebody takosubo. Without angiogram, it is difficult to tell there is a takosubo. So emotional factor in a postmenopausal woman precipitating an MI, which in the ECG will show ST elevation MI. You do the echo or LV angio shows RWMA, apical ballooning, and you do a coronary angio is normal. Then you stamp them at Takosubo. I think that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Dr. Sanjeevani, you wanted to ask something. Please uh, unmute and ask. Okay. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Murlidhar, for keeping uh, Dr. Mahala's lecture really Really, it was wonderful and uh, as usual, uh, you know, um, giving us tremendous information. Uh, Dr. Mahala, in LBBB, yes. okay, uh, how to diagnose LAD? I must have missed it. You were explaining about LBBB, yes. but how to diagnose LAD lesion because the septum is already jerky and yes. uh, that part of the LAD we cannot comment. So how to be sure that it is a LAD lesion? Uh, yes, ma'am. So LBBB and uh, ischemic heart disease echo, they resemble each other in all aspects like RWMA, including MR, dilatation, everything, LVDS function. But the issue is here, we have the confusion. That is why we have certain ECG criteria called Garbosa criteria. We utilize that ST elevation in the entry leads, ST depression, ST elevation with the concurrent uh, ST, uh, in the leads. So we have certain criteria. We said these many points satisfying Garbosa criteria, then it is MI, otherwise LB. However, as in the guideline, as I've said, new onset LBB with ischemic symptoms like history and troponin elevated should not be stamped as a routine LBB degenerative and requiring a CRT later date. It should be treated as ischemic heart disease with the troponin and ischemic symptoms and new onset LB. If still you have a doubt, the patient should go for either an angiography or a CT angiography to be sure there is no coronary artery. So all practical purposes, new onset LBBB, along with symptoms and biomarker, will be treated as ST elevation MI or ischemic heart disease. Uh, thank you very much, Ramurlidhar. Can you, I go ahead uh, with uh, the same uh, uh, question? Uh, yes. Dr. Mahala, um, sure, sure, actually, sure. Huh, thank you, thank you. Uh, um, uh, as we are speaking about echocardiography in uh, LBBB, uh, I'm learning from you. Uh, in LBBB, septum looks jerky, but if you go to two chamber view on transthoracic echo yes. and see the anterior wall, uh, regional wall motion in anterior wall and septum jerky, then can we diagnose it as a LAD lesion? That is, that was actually my in my mind. Even though you diagnose a report, you will not be reporting as a LAD lesion, you will be reporting as a okay. RWM. Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you. And uh, used, it should be corroborated with a coronary anatomy. There is no block. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kirti Chandran, you wanted to ask something. Can you unmute and ask the question? Dr. Keerthi Chandran. Hello, good yeah, morning. Please sir. unmute and ask your question. Yes, yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, audible. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sir, good morning, sir. Sir, my question is uh, in case of myocardial infarction, is there any modality which can detect uh, MI uh, at the level of perfusion abnormality? Uh, can GLS, GLS be helpful in that state, sir? Uh, <coughs> yes. If I if you have noticed that side of ischemic cascade, I have said after normal there is a perfusion abnormality 
which can be picked up in a contrastic or you need a special agent or mycodel perfusion which is a uh, mpi scan you can do that but after that the diastole function you can get diastole abnormality which i have shown in my slide and but that is you know elderly person you can get a diastole dysfunction so it, you cannot say this is an mi next comes the gls yes if you pick up the gls i have given you two hints before rwma comes you can pick up the gls that's one number two i have given the second hint if you think that patient is sitting in front of you stable no heart failure mi just entered in you have a gls there and is showing say around 10 is lesser it is reduced significant and this patient can go into heart failure in front of you go into a progress into heart failure suddenly or you can throw an arrhythmia or arrest so if you have a gls at that point of time it's showing significantly low figure you should be little cautious or you address or attend that coronary artery which is caused in fact very quick so time is muscle what we say we teach our student time is muscle as you will be delaying or not opening the infarct related artery these things can happen in front of you so you should quickly if you have a gls you are doing it very quick then without delaying to the cath lab so you can get some information which will help you thank you sir thank you so much thank you very much thank you so good morning sir dr nagraj may i sir yes yeah. please yes uh sir this is uh, related to the intraoperative uh, echocardiography see we uh, in a case of uh, coronary artery disease usually after grafting yes. after grafting certain uh, coronary vessels you suddenly have an st segment elevation right so after giving the flows so right. once right. there is an st segment elevation see uh, after certain point say after 1 uh, 1 mm st segment elevation or 1.5 mm st segmentation then uh, we try to increase the perfusion pressure and when we try to see but most of the times they ask about the echo and the pulmonary artery pressures so the echo usually the segmental wall motion abnormalities as the teaching goes it appears very early within seconds but it doesn't usually happen um, can you comment on that sir i mean how to actually guide the surgeon whether <laughs> the adequacy of grafting is is right or whether he should redo the grafting if you don't have any other modalities to assess the coronary blood flow yes and this is a very important and practical question actually many times you'll be seeing this and this is very not very unusual yeah. Yeah. as you said yes. uh, that uh, if there is an acute coronary ischemia i am ligating a coronary artery or i am keeping a balloon inflated so after how many minutes or beats the ischemic things changes will happen in the experimental model it has been seen if you like it a coronary artery artery after 5 to 6 beats rwma will appear so it is not a very long time if the acutely it is happening it's like as in or suppose there is in a calcific aortic stenosis and decalcification has been done and calcium has entered into the right coronary artery you get the ecg still elevation after 5 to 6 beats that is one number 2 as i have said in the echo new regional wall motion abnormalities or loss of myocardial viability or loss of myocardial motion what you will be seeing new rwm that means pre surgery you should have in your mind concrete idea about the rwm which segments which view are not contracting or contracting well and if the it happens in the same territory like say example i am having embolages in the right coronary artery and right coronary artery had a small infarct before i may not get appreciation of that very easily and i will go with the ecg if you get a new onset rwma that speaks about the problem in that coronary artery and about the biomarkers we don't do it but post cbg or during cbg on table even the ckmb troponin has to be elevated more than 10 times in pci has to be elevated more than 5 times whereas upper limit more than 99% of normal we consider as elevation but not in cbg so biomarker not helpful ecg definitely will pick up after 5 to 6 beats new rwma you should pick it up then you say that there is some problem in that artery that has to be looked at again so that i think this is a practical point it should answer your question yeah say so, say so the when we have a regional wall motion abnormality in that particular area where the st segment elevation is actually present then yes, yes. we always tell the surgeon yes you got to redo the graft no, but if no, even is, not oh, new onset suppose you have a grade 2 that is hypokinesia now yeah. that segment has gone into akinesia 
that is definitely an issue suppose you have a, uh, like you say uh, normal motion hypokinesia you can pick it up but if the hypokinesia it is yeah. not a kinesia which we miss oh it was there before no it is a hypokinetic now it has become a kinetic so there is acute problem yes sir and what st segment elevation should alarm the yeah, surgeon is, should, yeah. should be alert the surgeon that, 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 that this st segment elevation is definitely alarm if you don't see a st segment, uh, segment uh, elevation and normally you were checking which lids if the inferior lids 1 mm is fine but you are checking the chest lids b1 b2 requires 2 mm other lids like a female uh, 40 years or less than 40 years there is a criteria less than 2 mm or more than more than 1.5 mm all other lids like chest lids 1 mm limb lids 1 mm only v1 v2 may be 1.5 in female 2 mm in male so if you look at v1 v2 you should consider two and if other lids one if we are getting inferior which commonly we get like air going to the right coronary artery calcium going to the right coronary artery so the right coronary insult during so cabg or grafting or valve change so there you look at the inferior one in 1 mm st elevation uh, that is enough for you to die thank you sir uh, regard uh, regarding the regional wall motion abnormality on echocardiogram degree yes. intraoperative day yes. tea sometimes the if the myocardium is stunned even if the blood flow is uh, happening it may still look as a regional wall motion abnormality on the echocardiogram so in such case uh, surgeon's opinion and if you have a electromagnetic flow meter these two things will aid uh, to decide whether you should go back and redo the grafting or not if the surgeon says the says that he is he is happy with the grafting and with the flow meter you have demonstrated the adequate flow even in the presence of regional wall motion abnormality that can be left alone and it's a matter of time that it will recover yes i agree with the dr mollidhar but i want to pass this comment here This yes, RWMA, yes. which you find uh, routinely, the stunning or patients on bypass, especially one this second, is seen in the second, system. One second, one second, one second. All the uh, people who are not speaking must uh, keep the mics muted, please. Rajiv, please yeah. keep the mics muted except those who are speaking. Uh, please continue, Doctor Mahal. Ah uh, yes, sir. Ah uh, that uh, what you described the RWMA that patients on cardiac pulmonary bypass. It has been yeah, reported yeah. that RWMA occurs categorically in the septum IVS. Yes, yes. And if you get like this inferior, which we commonly find in post-op or during op, so that is separately you can pick it up. But yes, as you said rightly, you, you can have a RWMA on the septum, which you cannot stamp as ischemic heart disease unless you have ECG ST elevation. So just plain by going at RWMA, one cannot say yes. that surgeon go back again. so you will have ecg Correct. you will have hemodynamics not favoring you you are not coming out of the bypass and you are getting areas other than the septum that becomes a clue for you you can you can proceed you can tell the surgeon uh, bluntly say you need to re, re go and see it inside yes right thank you thank you thank and you, thank somebody you, had raised the hand. somebody raised the hand uh, anybody wants to ask any question we will be closing this session in about 4 minutes anybody wants to ask any question so the one last may i sir dr nagraj sir yes Sorry. yes 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 sir. and yes 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 sir, sir uh, mahala sir yes uh, there is there is a graft which has been put in intraoperatively right. and the st segments the right. st segments are wavering say it is uh, say 0.5 mm to 2 mm and suddenly right. it reduces to again 0.5 mm yes. again it increases to 2 mm so we are as a surgeon to open the chest yes so once he opens the chest still the st segments are wavering from 0.5 to 1 cm the lad had got a very good flow right. and the lima also was preferentially a good flow so um, can you comment on the competitive flow or why is it happening uh this is a, uh, we don't get a competitive flow st dynamic st this is what you are talking about dynamic st changes right so sir, it is right, right. like stuttering mi these right. things can happen handling the lima lima on usually do not go into spasm but it can happen if there is a spasm which is relieved or uh, the the spasm beyond the site of anastomosis which gets relieved so when you go back and you see the flow is very good 
but to, to say so, it happens mostly in the radial artery. You are putting a radial artery graft, and the radial artery is notorious to go into spasm. And lima also can go into spasm. You can get dynamic changes. And dynamic changes means what we get in the ICU dynamic changes. We don't sit quietly. You have to address that because there is something going on physically. So the dynamic changes, what you were talking about, radial artery, yes, I can understand is spasm. Lima, I will think of seriously, there may be a spasm. Or anastomotic side, beyond just beyond the anastomosis, there may be a spasm, which is a mechanical touching of the vessel. So some spasm, antispasmodic drugs might help in this situation before you ask them to go back. And that will be my take here. The, but in spasm, do you think the spasm will release and again they'll go into spasm cell because HTC Yes, it like can dynamic. happen. It can happen dynamic okay. changes. Okay. And suppose you, what you said is right, you went back and you saw the flow is very good. How do you explain this? Yeah. What is yeah, that's wrong? right. That's right. Yeah. Sure. Sir, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody raise the hand. Can uh, he unmute and ask the question? He or she? Lither, can I have yes, a couple yes, of yes. Uh, Dr. Mala? This, uh, if we have LAD territory regional wall, yes, motion abnormality with basal inferior lateral hypokinesia, yes. So, can we say that this is type 3 LAD? Uh, that's what uh, uh, you people uh, yes. always do. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a little difficult, but in the echo to pick up the type 3 LAD. Uh, or wrap around LED, which can give the posterior yeah. part of the septum as well, will be very difficult because re echo uh, does not say about the wrap around or the large LED. And that will be an angiographic dictum of uh, dominant RCA, dominant LCX, or wrap around LED. But echo wise, as, as I have mentioned very clearly, you say this area is LED, this area is RCA, this area is LCX, these are water set areas. So the problem happens in the water side areas rather than saying that is a large wrap around LED. Mm -hmm. So because of the stunning, the adjacent areas will not be contracting. So that will give a many patients in STEMI that comes to the triage report EF 20%. And you do angioplasty and next day or next day is the EF 35, 40%. So that is not a true EF uh, because of this adjacent water side areas having stunning. So to say in a echo wrap around LED, uh, I will go a little slow on this. I will be seeing the angiography and okay. big area and the PD is coming from the LED or part of the septum and the part of the RV wall getting infected uh, with the type 3 LED. So uh, it will be my angiography diagnosis other than echo diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, Mulidhar, can I go ahead with uh, one more question? Uh, please ask Sriman Naran, I think you can. I think you can because the experts... Yeah, you can ask the... last question, please. Uh, because already it is yes. 9 at 10 o'clock. Yes. Okay, can I? Okay, uh, about this uh, septal dyskinesia after any cardiac surgery. Yes. Uh, it remains so forever. That's the observation. So, can you please uh, talk on this? Uh, I think that uh, Murlidhar can comment on this. He has done some study. But we have seen the septal bradykinesia or hypokinesia post CABGEN bypass. Uh, I am not very sure this is reported in a beating heart. And this uh, uh, hypokinesia or bradykinesia, the septum and bypass, usually recovers with the time. Not completely recovery, but there is some recovery with the time. And uh, the, what we found in uh, the bundle branch block created during TAVI, and uh, this bradykinesia it takes long time so to recover, and it may not recover, which is an electrical phenomenon. And uh, probably it is a myocardial phenomenon happens in bypass, not electrical, so which may recover with time. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with these statements, and... Uh... Thank you so much. And there is a question on repeat uh, levels of proponin I to be considered as significant during and after CABG. After CABG, it is 10 times the, the upper uh, one value, uh, above the 10 times the upper reference limit uh, that should be considered after C uh, CABG. And uh, with this, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Simon Narayan to make concluding remarks and close the session. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mala and uh, Dr. Murlida. Uh, a very nice uh, uh, session on STEMI, MI, and ECHO. Uh, 
concludingly that uh, uh, echo is a uh, diagnostic tool in aid of uh, stemi uh, we should not forget uh, that uh, doing echo is always helpful then uh, uh, only they taking echo as a diagnostic tool thank you everybody uh, they are told in the session thank you so now. much Thank, thank you, you thank, thank you, you, you thank, thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak to you people thank you thank, thank you very you. much thanks for accepting and being with us thank you so much we will contact you sometime later for some other talk it's thank you pleasure. so much thank and you. have a good sunday thank you have a good sunday thank, thank you, you.